Good morning and good afternoon to all you wonderful people, all 15 of you besides myself, who are here today with us uh, to make it to the fourth virtual forum of the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees, what we call as the WNPT, an endeavor that was established by Victor Pereira Sanchez, my friend and colleague who's here with us today, obviously. Um, today's event is going to be focused on the Lebanese mental health arena, uh, witnessing and co-creating hope. And uh, we, alongside, we also have, in addition to this virtual forum where we, where we have four very accomplished panelists speaking to their experiences and their recent work, we also have a fundraising event to support mental health care services at the American University of Beirut. Um, the flyer that has been going around has a link associated with it. Um, for you to click on and donate as you wish. And we can obviously place that in the chat box as well. But uh, more on that later. The WNPT was uh, a very unique endeavor of its kind established by Victor. I'll let him tell you the statistics of when, how, how many members, how many people across uh, different countries around the world are participating in it. Uh, but really, it is, it is one of its kind. It doesn't have any like it, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, many, many different trainees across the world engage in it. And I think that the momentum for it got going because of COVID when we had to connect with each other on virtual platforms way more frequently than we would have imagined. Um, so because of that, we sort of found, found ourselves coming closer, sharing interests, research interests, um, other things among, you know, friendships um, and some very meaningful relationships with people around the world. Um, it is a very rewarding thing for me, especially, and I joined the bandwagon as uh, associate director later on, uh, much after Victor had already laid the groundwork for the, for the WNPT to go. Um, all right, so like I was saying, today's event has four panelists, which will be introduced to you by my colleagues, Sarah and Mohammed as we go along. Um, welcome to all of you. I hope you enjoy what we have for you today. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Victor to tell you about WNPT. Thank you very much, Sania. Uh, and I'm so honored to have uh, Sania as uh, the Associate Director of the network. Um, so the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees was established in 2018. Uh, it started um, as a as a young resident in psychiatry in Spain, trying to connect with people from, from other countries. And it grew very steadfastly, especially during the year of the pandemic. Um, um, and now counts, the, well, let me share the screen briefly and show you. Uh, during the last forum, we, we presented uh, our first website uh, of, the, of the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees that is here. I will put it on the chat as well. That is worldtrainees.org, very simple. Um, and currently we have um, more than 300 members from all continents, uh, 62 countries. Um, and, and we have had three virtual meetings. This is the fourth. And our members come from all over the world, uh, including uh, Lebanon. Uh, although in this, in this map, it's, it's difficult to to, to get uh, to get into it, but, but uh, we have a lot, uh, we have members from in Lebanon and members um, and Lebanese members that are in in the diaspora, especially in the United States, and also most of our members come from low and middle income countries, and we are very proud of that of being a, a diverse network and this made by trainees and made for trainees, and. Um, Part of our mission is to connect uh, trainees from all over the world, to connect them also with, with senior psychiatrists and to promote this uh, regular monthly or every two, three months activities called the virtual forum where, where we uh, come together, we network and, uh, we, and we learn from, okay, and we learn from, from mental health in different in different countries and, and different aspects of mental health globally. Our first uh, forum was on, on, on systemic race, racism in the United States. Our second forum was about uh, the mental health in the, in the Horn of Africa. Um, a month ago, we have a forum about um, psychiatric Chinese that are mothers in different parts of the world. Now we are talking about Lebanon and the next forum, uh, 
that we'll announce, uh, we are still organizing, but will be uh, based on, on India. And we'll also count on, on colleagues in India and colleagues from India in other countries. And with that, I don't want to take more time because here the protagonists are the moderators, uh, Sara Halabi, Mohamed El Chaido, and uh, the, the speakers. Thank you very much for giving me this time to, to talk about my passion. And, and yeah, welcome to Ahmed Hankir, the wounded healer, famous on Twitter for, for joining us today. Welcome, Hamid. Thanks for joining. Lovely to have you, Dr. Hankir. So without further ado, I'm going to be introducing two of our lovely panelists. Hi. Hello. Dr. Abi Rashid is currently an associate researcher at Sciences Po Paris. She was trained as a medical doctor, a philosopher, and a historian of science and medicine. Her most recent book, Asfuri, A History of Madness, Modernity, and War in the Middle East, MIT Press 2020. That's her most recent book. Her presentation will focus on an overview of the crumbling in patient psychiatric care, not only in Lebanon, but also in the region. She will be discussing some historical perspectives and then will share evidence of the present state of inpatient care. She will then suggest a provocative way forward to deal with what she calls the resilience of institutionalization in the Arab world and crumbling inpatient psychiatric care. I've personally read Dr. Abidashid's book and it is brilliant and seminal work. Um, and now I will be introducing Dr. Torbe. Dr. Torbe is a child and adolescent psychiatrist in the psychiatric mental health program and the pain rehabilitation program at Kennedy Krager Institute. She is also an assistant professor at John Hopkins University of Medicine. Dr. Torbe's professional interests include interdisciplinary care of complex patients, somatic symptom disorders, and pediatric chronic pain. And she will be discussing the impact of mass trauma, war slash explosions very briefly, and will introduce data by her collabor collaborators in Lebanon in regards to the blast, and then introduced her expatriate study, the reasons behind it, and some brief data. Hamad. All right, so Dr. Malouf, Dr. Fadi Malouf will be also joining us today. Uh, Dr. Malouf is an associate professor and the current chairperson of the Department of Psychiatry at the American University of Beirut Medical Center. He is also the director of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Program. Uh, Dr. Malouf completed his residency training at the Harvard Medical School and the Boston Veterans Administration Healthcare System, followed by a fellowship in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General and McLean Hospital. Uh, another panelist joining us today will be Dr. Maya Bizre, and Dr. Bizre is an assistant professor of clinical specialty at the American University of Beirut Medical uh, Center. She also currently serves as the director of the psycho-oncology unit. Uh, after completing her residency training at uh, the American University of Beirut, she pursued a fellowship in psychosomatic medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. So, Sarah. Would... Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to begin our talk today with a small excerpt on the work of beloved Emily Masrallah and late Emily Masrallah, a seminal Lebanese author who, who is one of my personal favorites. I will be reading a chunky paragraph from her book, Awraq Mansiya, which means uh, forgotten papers. And then I will be roughly translating it into English, but I will begin with Arabic because it is right that the script begins in our mother tongue. So, Hakeza tasa'altu qabla sanatayn. وأنا أقف في المكان ذاته على عتبة داري المحروقة أمام رسم لفراشة عملاقة خرجت من تفجر زجاج الباب الجانبي لقد شغلتني الفراشة في حينه عن بؤس المشهد فالتفألت بها خصوصا وأن هذه المخلوقة الصغرى بين الكائنات تعني بالنسبة إلي أكثر من الأجنحة الرفرافة والنقلة الرشيقة والانطلاق الحر والغبار الملون إنها صلة رمزية تصلني بالكون الأرحب وتحمل إلي بشائر الفرح والطمأنينة تقول أي فرح يمكن أن ينهض في الصدر وأنت تشاهد بيتك بكل ما بنيته من داخله من ثمين معنى ومادة كومة رماد هذا الكلام سمعته وبلهجة ساخرة وبرغم ذلك لم يفارقني التفاؤل واعتبرت الفراشة رسالة لم أفض غلافها حتى الآن يومها طلبت من النجار قبل أن يباشر بصنع الأبواب والنوافذ والخزائن لقيامة البيت طلبت, من طلبت منه أن يصنع إطارا لتلك اللوحة الفريدة لتحفظ داخل بيت, بيت زجاجي يحميها من التفتفت لتحفظ داخل بيت زجاجي يحميها من التفتفت 
وتظل علامة تفاؤل ورمز البشارة هكذا تطرق القصة بابي في بعض الأحيان وكل ما أفعله هنا هو أنني أنقل صورتها إليكم بكثير من الصدق والأمانة A rough translation of this is that Imadina Salaza is standing in front of her house that is um, in rubbles and she is wondering how she could possibly find hope and a butterfly passes by her and she asks her carpenter as he rebuilds her home to frame a picture of a butterfly in a big glass frame so that she could look upon it and uh, take faith and hope from that metaphor. So some reflections on that and what that means with regards to witnessing since this event is about witnessing. I suppose this is what witnessing is. So it's the act of watching closely and carrying what we see to others. As Lebanese people, we have been forced into witnessing historically, momentarily, and to be realistic, so will, all descent, so, so will our descendants and thousands of people who will come after us. It becomes difficult to disentangle trauma from language and culture, but it is also equally difficult to disentangle joy from our culture. Now, I'm not here to speak to you of resilience, that much dreaded, even loathed word. We perhaps do not want to be resilient. We want to rest. We want to have access to medications, to healthcare, to fuel, to food, to clean air and water, to a safe and prosperous, and above all, to a country we love. And I suppose we can look for guidance. We can look at Emily for guidance on how to build a nation. We could look to her invaluable words about watching with integrity and transmitting stories as we see them. The butterfly in Emily's story is a metaphor, and how powerful metaphors can be the act of honoring one another's humanity. As she watched her home crumble, she thought of something that represented more from the destruction around her, and she did not merely think of hope, she enacted it. She asked the carpenter to frame a picture of a butterfly. So with that story, I ask you today to take these words and the precious act of witnessing and let it reverberate in your hearts and minds. We can. What we can do is not just to fathom hope, but to enact it. So yes, we can. What are the steps we must take, even if they begin in metaphor? And perhaps at this point, they must begin in metaphor in order to build this country. And not just any country, but I mean our country. So be careful in your witnessing, faithful in your imagination, and sturdy in your hearts. With that, I turn us over to Muhammad. Right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so we're going to play the Lebanese anthem, national anthem for a minute before we start hearing from the panelists. <laughs> with a discussion now. Thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you so much, everyone. It is only right to begin the panel with a discussion of history. So Dr. Abi Rashid, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the generous introduction and for the invitation. And thank you, Sarah, for reading this inspiring passage from Emilie Nasrallah, Ne Abi Rashid. Uh, it could have served as uh, actually the epigraph uh, of my talk. So I'm really thankful that you read it. Let me see if this is going to work. I'm going to share my screen. Now this, can everyone see that? It looks beautiful, yes. Okay, great, so um, it's an honor to be a part of this important event at this crucial period for Lebanon, which uh, as you probably all know, has been going through a concatenation of crises, including an unprecedented economic crisis, which is having a catastrophic impact on healthcare delivery and practice. 
What I would like to do today, as Sarah mentioned in the 15 minutes I have, is to give you a broader diagnostic picture of the state of psychiatric care, not only in Lebanon, but also in the region. This picture, unfortunately, is one of a crumbling inpatient psychiatric care, which is perhaps more acutely visible today in Lebanon, given the disastrous socioeconomic situation, which, by the way, not only refers to a bankrupt state and hence bankrupt public health services, but also to the fact that more than half the population is now trapped in poverty and struggling to get the bare necessities, this amid an unprecedented exodus of qualified healthcare personnel. I will try to end with a hopeful note, so by suggesting a possible, if provocative, solution. So let me start with the past. Now, it's important to remember that despite the current bleak picture and total collapse of the state and its institutions, including the healthcare system, Lebanon was a pioneer in psychiatric care and practice in the region. It had one of the first modern psychiatric hospitals in the Middle East. The hospital, which is known in colloquial Arabic as Asfuriye, and in, Igl in English, initially as the Lebanon Hospital for the Insane, and later as the Lebanon Hospital for Mental and Nervous Disorders, was founded in 1896 and lasted until the civil war that erupted in 1975. It closed its doors in 1982. Over almost nine decades, the hospital trained generations of psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses in the region. It gave hope to countless of patients. It introduced the latest therapeutic approaches to mental illness. It created numerous outpatient clinics. It was actually affiliated with the American University of Beirut since 1920. It contributed to the institutionalization of psychiatry. It changed norms, beliefs, and behaviors vis-a-vis -vis mental illness and tried to tackle the stigmatization of mental illness by pioneering an open door policy as early as the 1950s. And ironically, many of its graduates ended up advising and shaping the mental health policies and strategies of many neighboring countries, not only in the Gulf countries, but also in the Horn of Africa. The last medical director of Asfourier, Antranik Manoukian, even envisaged a revamped vision of psychiatric care in the region as early as 1956. He envisioned a state-of-the-art psychiatric institute, and here you can see the maquette, that would provide mental health services and expert advice and focus on short-term treatment. But the project was adopted in 1976, when it was already too late. The civil war, the bloody civil war, I must say, that would last 15 years, had started a year earlier. During that civil war, the hospital incurred a lot of debt and damages, mostly due to the direct consequences of war, coupled with the fact that the government was uh, indebted to the hospital, as is ironically the case today in Lebanon, and a changing moral economy in the region. In fact, it was the civil war that was the coup de grace to this modernization project and to the modernization movement that emerged in the 19th century, the so-called Nahda, or intellectual and cultural and socio-political renaissance movement. And today, the hospital unfortunately lies in ruins. As you can see, these are the remains of the forensic unit that was opened in the late 1950s, a first in the region, and part of Asfuriye's philosophy of decriminalizing substance use and humanizing so-called criminal insanity. These medical ruins, as I call them, include a broader range of ruins, including hospitals destroyed by war, as is more conspicuous the case in Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan. This is one of the Médecins Sans Frontières hospitals in Afghanistan that was shelled, totally destroyed. But they also include the colonial remains of hospitals and other colonial projects that are more visible in Africa, for instance. They also include the remains of deinstitutionalization, a process primarily in Europe and North America that brought an end to large psychiatric hospitals following the anti-psychiatry movement of the 1960s. And this is an emblematic picture taken from an inventory of an abandoned psychiatric hospitals that illustrates this process that started in the 60s, intensified in the 70s, and continued way into the 1990s. The ongoing war in Syria has certainly exacerbated the precarious state of, psychiatric, of the psychiatric infrastructure. Patients have been killed, and various psychiatric hospitals have been severely damaged by shelling. In the Iraqi context, one can tell a similar story of neglect, lack of psychiatric personnel, overcrowded facilities, and decaying infrastructure, all of which are in great part the consequence of now two decades of conflict and war 
displacement, and terror. On a recent pre-pandemic trip to Algeria, I also witnessed firsthand, unfortunately, the same state of decay and neglect at the main psychiatric hospital just outside Algiers, the Bida Psychiatric Hospital, otherwise known as the Bida Joinville Psychiatric Hospital, where the famous Martinique psychiatrist, Franz Fanon, taught and worked in the 1950s. And here you can see a dusty portrait of Franz Fanon at the entrance of the hospital. And one can add to these ruins, these new medical ruins in the Arab world that include the crumbling psychiatric infrastructure and institutions, some due to mismanagement and lack of investment in mental health, others due to negligence and to the current dire economic situation as is the, the case in Lebanon. But what is clearly common to the Arab world is the fact that in contrast to the West that witnessed a wave of deinstitutionalization that I mentioned earlier, Lunatic asylums, so to speak, have not left the Arab world. Quite the contrary, they have grown in size. Today, Egypt, Lebanon, Algeria, and Iraq host some of the largest psychiatric hospitals in the world. Egypt's Abbasiyah, which in the late 19th century had 300 beds, has today more than 1,500 beds. A Rashad Mental Hospital in Iraq, which was founded in the mid 1950s, with originally 400 beds, has more than 1,300 beds. Lebanon's Hôpital Psychiatrique de la Croix, otherwise known as Deir es Salib or the Hospital of the Cross, which started in the early 1920s as a modest asylum for elderly priests, has more than 1,100 beds. Algeria's Bida Joinville Psychiatric Hospital that I mentioned earlier, which opened in 1938 with 1,200 beds, has today an impressive capacity of 2,200 beds. And this is a picture of Al Fanar Hospital which was until recently the third largest psychiatric hospital in Lebanon. It's in the south of Lebanon and had to close recently, in fact, a year before the economic crisis erupted because patients, it appeared, were living in indecent and inhumane conditions. They were literally abandoned. Now, you can say that high income countries generally tend to have many more psychiatric beds than low and lower middle income countries. That is correct. But uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but the majority of these beds uh, tend to be in psychiatric units within general hospitals and or in community-based residential facilities rather than in mental hospitals per se. And according to the World Health Organization, this configuration of mental health inpatient care is one indication of successful deinstitutionalization. Unfortunately, this is where the unfortunately is, um, in contrast, uh, as you can see on the graph, we see the opposite trend in the Arab world. Although the average for the Middle East and North Africa region, the so-called MENA region, uh, has in terms of institutionalization pattern, which is measured in terms of beds in mental hospitals as a proportion of all psychiatric inpatient beds, uh, a proportion which is not dramatically worse, 72% than the global average, which is 66%, the difference is more substantial for Arab countries which have 81% of beds in mental hospitals on average. The economic crisis in Lebanon has made the situation, of course, even worse. And Deir es Salib, the hospital of the cross that I mentioned earlier, which is Lebanon's largest mental hospital, can now and only mental hospital, actually not only, but there is another hospital, but the main and largest psychiatric hospital can now barely feed its patients. The situation is quite dramatic. Uh, and the needs are increasing, as you will be hearing from the other panelists, I'm sure, while the quality of care is unfortunately dwindling. So wherever we look at, be it in Lebanon or in the rest of the Arab world, we see neglected infrastructures, a crumbling inpatient psychiatric care, what I call the resilience of institutionalization, and in some countries, like in Lebanon, worsening of the neglect and deterioration, and Lebanon now faces an acute shortage in essential mental health medications and all of which are met with a shocking apathy from the ruling governing class. And this is why I'd like to argue that psychiatrists, mental health workers, and the civil society more broadly speaking, in other words, all the key actors that are usually marginalized by Arab regimes have now a momentous role to play despite the many challenges and obstacles facing them from their own leaders and their own governments. In the absence of reliable institutions and sometimes their lack altogether, it behooves them and it, it behooves us all to take on the role of the absent welfare state and indeed the absence of the state by raising awareness about mental health disparities, 
stigma, abuse, and human rights violations. It also behooves us all to refuse to be complicit with authoritarian and patriarchal regimes and resist both the security apparatus on the one hand and on the other hand, families that use mental illness as a pretext to get rid of dissidents uh, in the case of the former as what happened in Egypt, for example, during the uprisings or unwanted relatives in the case of the latter. Finally, like with the Black Lives Matter or Occupy movements, I think it is today up to the civil society to mobilize and decry the crumbling inpatient psychiatric care, as well as the neglect of mental health issues. Regimes in the Arab world have long abdicated their responsibilities for the welfare of their own citizens. And I'm afraid to say provocatively that WHO reports are no longer useful besides their descriptive and archival purposes. In addition, many families seem to have abandoned their ill relatives, either because they cannot afford taking care of them or simply because of the lack of policies to reintegrate mentally ill individuals into the community. It is perhaps too much to ask of psychiatrists, of you, psychiatrists in training and professional psychiatrists and other mental health workers whose priorities and understandably so are their own patients, but also their own sanity, especially when they work in such stressful and challenging environments to become activists, indeed militants, as I'm arguing, but I think that this has become inevitable and indeed necessary. So I will leave it there and I look forward to your thoughts. Thank you so much, Joel. Just a kind reminder, if anyone has any questions about what Joel has just said, please type it in the chat or message me or Muhammad privately. Very brilliantly done, but I will turn this over to Muhammad now. Right, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Abi Rashid. This was beautiful. Uh, so now we're going to move to uh, Dr. Fadi Malouf. Uh, Dr. Malouf will be discussing the response of the Department of Psychiatry at UBMC to the recent calamities and present some data on the impact of the explosion on children and adolescents based on a study he led in Beijing. The floor is yours, Dr. Thank you. I'm trying here to share my screen. Let's see here. Looks great. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, thank you all for this event. I want to thank uh, Victor and Sanya for chairing uh, this session and also Sarah and Muhammad for a great uh, introduction. It was very refreshing to also hear some um, excerpts from uh, Emily Misradla's work. Uh, over the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll try to uh, share with you uh, as a chair of the Department of Psychiatry, uh, what we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years in terms of response to the multiple uh, calamities uh, that have impacted Lebanon in general, but also some of them have impacted the global population as well. So for those of you who have not visited Lebanon uh, and AUB, you're invited uh, to visit when time permits. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the most beautiful campus in the region. We've been um, privileged and uh, lucky to be situated in this uh, beautiful campus by the Mediterranean Sea uh, in Beirut. Uh, so this is our uh, strategic priorities in the department. So we do have you know, a strategic plan for clinical care, for research, but education uh, that includes transferring knowledge through fellowships and residencies, but also uh, uh, capacity building for uh, colleagues in uh, the mental health field. Most importantly, uh, uh, engaging with the community is one of our pillars, and you'll see uh, how we did that. Uh, and how we've been doing that. As an overview uh, and to follow up on what Dr. Abirashid has just presented, 
uh, I'll share with you our experience with inpatient care, but in general, these are our services. We have multidisciplinary outpatient adult psychiatry and psychotherapy uh, clinics and services. Our inpatient unit, um, uh, we used to have a 10 bed inpatient unit. Uh, with the COVID crisis, uh, we had to um, downsize it uh, because uh, uh, the building was used to accommodate the COVID patients. So now we took over the sleep unit in the main hospital and we're down to four or uh, five uh, bed unit. This was the case also in other hospitals, either after the explosion where uh, the um, psychiatric units were damaged or uh, also due to COVID. So we've been really, in addition to what Dr. Uh, Abirashid presented historically, uh, we've been um, more recently uh, living a crisis uh, regarding inpatient psychiatric care. Many of our patients present with the emergency room and there is at times no place to uh, send them to because most of the inpatient units in the general hospitals have been full. So we end up um, keeping them in the emergency room until a safety plan is in place before they leave uh, and go home. Uh, we are subspecialized, so we do have addiction program, psychosis program, a cognitive rehab program, psycho-oncology program, eating disorders program, some neuromodulation as well, uh, efforts. And we have a very uh, uh, strong child and adolescent services that are multidisciplinary in nature, not only just psychotherapy and psychiatry, but also uh, as part of these services, we have uh, the AUBMC Learning Center, where we do offer um, special education, speech therapy, and psychomotor therapy for kids with uh, disabilities, whether uh, these are developmental or educational in nature. And we do offer as well neuropsychological and psychoeducational uh, assessments. So this is in a nutshell what we do in the Department of Psychiatry at AUB. Again, uh, we're uh, like any other psychiatric, academic psychiatric department, it's a large department, multidisciplinary in nature. Uh, and uh, we really uh, pride ourselves for being able to also offer training programs for residents and uh, fellows and education for the medical students and psychology trainees. So we've heard about uh, the different uh, calamities. I'd like to call them multiple whammies. So these are the different whammies that have impacted uh, Lebanon in general. So in addition to the global pandemic uh, and uh, kids studying from home with all uh, the um, disadvantages of online education and the stressors that come with it, uh, there has been also a very severe economic crisis. But something that uh, not mentioned in the news as much is, uh, and we see it clinically, uh, losses and many because of the immigration that has taken place lately and many families who have uh, left the countries, we've seen um, clinically a lot of people have to deal now with uh, losing friends, family members uh, to uh, immigration and uh, they have to adjust to these uh, losses. So these are uh, some of the calamities, but the, the most important one, as, as, as you all know, was the Beirut explosion on August 4th, where 200 people died, 6,000 got displayed, and uh, more than 1,000 children were in urgent need of assistance uh, uh, on, on that day. The, so in our department over the last couple of years, we've had series of uh, responses kept in place. So we, we were operating really as a crisis uh, intervention uh, on, instead of you know, just dealing with everyday work or in addition to dealing with everyday work. For the COVID, we had to launch our telemental health services and some of you may have heard of this. Uh, and these, because patients were quarantined at home, so we ended up, uh, uh, revamping our telemental health services to include not only psychotherapy, but psychiatric care as well, and other rehabilitative uh, services. We did as well offer uh, mental health support for our faculty and staff, and we did have a lot of public uh, webinars through our mental health academy uh, targeting um, the general public and giving them um, advice and tips like, on uh, dealing with the pandemic. This is you know, a flyer about our own telehealth services. Uh, 
moving on to the Beirut explosion, uh, and this is a uh, where I'd like to share with you some uh, data on uh, what we've done. Uh, being a child and adolescent psychiatrist myself. So in addition to being a chair of the department, my research interest was uh, has been uh, in the prevalence of psychiatric disorders in children and adolescents in Lebanon specifically. I had the opportunity to conduct the first and only study that looked at the national prevalence of psychiatric disorders in children and adolescents in Lebanon. But then uh, this study was conducted a couple of years before the explosion. Right after the explosion, we thought that we would be interested to see uh, uh, what's the impact of this explosion on children and adolescents. And uh, to do this, we conducted an online study. This is just a review of the different um, man-made disasters in history. Uh, and our, uh, unfortunately, our August 4th explosion is one of them. It's right there with the uh, most uh, severe and largest uh, man-made explosions and disasters uh, in the world. So what we did, we did a cross-sectional online survey targeting primarily parents of uh, children between the, eight, uh, the age of eight and 17. It was an online survey that was shared on social media, but also through WhatsApp messages. Uh, we ended up recruiting 802 uh, uh, parents of children and adolescents. This is uh, the flyer that we used, the one on the right. So just for you to take a quick look here, you see that uh, the age group of the parents ranged from 25 to 60. And uh, I'll present to you the prevalence of depression, the prevalence of anxiety, and the prevalence of PTSD per age group. Uh, you'll see that uh, uh, in general, the, pressure, the prevalence of depression in this sample, uh, and again, I didn't go here through the details of how we assess this, but these were assessed through screening questionnaires. So the prevalence here is probable depression versus a diagnostic uh, depressive disorder. Uh, but you'll see here that uh, uh, for depression, we had 66% who, uh, I'm sorry, 33% who presented uh, with depression uh, in the overall population. What was striking really, and you'll see that in a moment, is the prevalence of anxiety. So 64% uh, of uh, kids and adolescents who were exposed to this blast uh, had a probable anxiety disorder or presented with clinically significant anxiety disorder, more so in the younger age group. So those who were between eight and 11, three quarter of them had clinically significant anxiety. Uh, for uh, PTSD, uh, interestingly, it's 50-50, uh, so 50%. So anxiety was much more prevalent uh, compared to PTSD in this uh, sample. But definitely 50% is not a negligible number. So 50% of these kids as well had PTSD symptoms. So you don't have to go through this in detail, but this is when we looked at the different um, correlates of uh, the different uh, conditions and disorders, you'll see that uh, proximity was, and I'll skip through this for the sake of time, I have them in my conclusion, uh, seeking help. So from uh, this sample, only 16% did seek help, although you know 75% had anxiety, 16% did seek help from a professional, 21% sought help from a non-professional, uh, and the majority did not seek any kind of help after the explosion. So comparing these prevalence rates to our national prevalence rates uh, before the explosion, these numbers were much higher. In our national study, we showed that the prevalence of uh, depression was 6%. Dr. Evelyn is attending with us and she's the one who took the lead on writing this paper uh, and that was published last year. Uh, the prevalence for anxiety was 23, and then we saw it after the explosion to go as high as 75%. And for PTSD, it was 20% in the national sample. And again, post the blast, it was 50%. The second uh, item uh, in the conclusion, and this is uh, when we analyzed and looked at the correlates, we saw that uh, 
the closer uh, geographically, and this is not counterintuitive, uh, and the families were to the event and the more directly impacted by the blast, whether through physical injuries or witnessing casualties or being displaced or having their uh, house damaged, the higher their uh, risk for uh, a, uh, either anxiety, depression, or PTSD. And lastly, uh, interestingly, we saw that uh, uh, those who did seek help after the explosion and in when I looked at the literature and I compared this finding to the 9-11 uh, uh, disaster in uh, New York, uh, the findings were completely opposite. So here, uh, kids who did seek help or families who did seek help had more uh, a higher prevalence of mental health disorders. In the US, it was the other way around. Those who got help actually had lower uh, prevalence of the disorders. And this tells us that here uh, we failed in uh, providing uh, uh, mental health interventions as a preventive uh, intervention and as a blanket intervention uh, the way they did it in the US. Uh, but instead here, people who, who, who had symptoms were themselves actively seeking uh, help and support. And that's why they were more symptomatic. Uh, right after the explosion, we uh, launched uh, the TASC clinic, which is the Trauma Assessment and Support Clinic, a free clinic uh, for uh, families, uh, whether adults or children who are impacted uh, by uh, the blast. Uh, this clinic since uh, developed to become TASI, the Trauma Assessment and uh, Support uh, Initiative. Uh, that includes uh, not only clinical services, but also research and uh, awareness uh, and capacity building around uh, trauma uh, services. Uh, I'll end with this. My colleagues, Dr. Joseph Lukhuri and Dr. Olivia Shah, talking about the task. The trauma assessment and support clinic was started two weeks after the Beirut 4th of August explosion with the purpose to serve the community uh, using the specialist resources we have in the department and to facilitate access for those who had not been in the psychiatric system uh, prior to this uh, situation. And so far, uh, many of our therapists and psychiatrists and residents have been involved in the treatment and provision of support for this population. We have been seeing many patients with symptoms serious enough to qualify as acute stress disorder and many others who are struggling emotionally, cognitively, physiologically, materially, medically, existentially with going back to some kind of normal or even conceiving of some kind of normal after the explosion. We anticipate that many of these cases will require follow-up and that in fact we'll probably see many new cases as the initial shock and numbness of the explosion die down and people are left to reconsider with incredibly challenging losses and realities. I want to thank the uh, World Network of Psychiatry Trainees for the opportunity. I know this is also uh, uh, an opportunity to raise funds to support our uh, mental health uh, fund at AUBMC. I want to share with you that this fund is used to uh, cover the expenses of uh, the underprivileged, especially those who need either uh, intensive outpatient care or uh, inpatient care uh, at the American University of Beirut. Thank you. All right, perfect, Dr. Malu. Thank you so much for this talk. Uh, so now we're gonna be moving to Dr. Torbay. Sarah is, is gonna, Dr. Torbay next, or are we having Dr. Bizri? So I was debating between, you know, amongst, uh, we were debating who to have first, but I think Dr. Torbay might be most fit thematically with Dr. Malu, seeing her work, and then we would have Dr. Bizri and Mask, as they say, the end is mask. So let's have Dr. Torbe. All right. Okay, great. Sure. Um, well, I'm glad we figured out the power cut. <laughs> okay. Sorry, everyone. I had a little bit of a power cut, which I never, ever have. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, I'm still disabled. I think it's because I got logged out and then logged back in. Yes. Okay, so I'm solving this now. 
Sorry. Make co host. Okay. Now, oh, here we go. Okay. Don't mind the mess, everyone. <laughs> okay. So here we go. So I'm Soraya Torbay. I'm one of the, I'm a child psychiatrist too, but um, most of the work that I'm going to present today is actually on adults. Um, okay. So I thought that I would give just a little bit of background about the Middle East and mental health in Lebanon before starting. I'm assuming, I'm gonna assume no one knows anything about it. So don't take offense to that. Um, okay, so I don't, have, I don't have any disclosures, financial disclosures or anything like that. So I'm just gonna get started by talking a little bit about a survey that was done in the past and around um, that was, I'm referencing Dr. Karam in 2007 and it was done by the WHO. And what it showed is that 17% of people who had responded to that survey actually had met criteria for a DSM disorder. 27% of them had classified as serious and 37, 36% as moderate. And 50% of the respondents had actually been exposed to war related traumatic events. So as everyone knows, the Middle East is often prone to wars and conflict, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. So the results showed a lot of affective disorders, anxiety disorders, impulse control disorders, and only 10% of that population had sought treatment. So what that tells us is that this population is already pretty vulnerable, and only by looking at it post-war, we're not even looking at anything that had happened last year. So I love this picture because it just tells how it is so representative of how Lebanese feel, the happiest depressed people you'll ever meet. Um, knowing Lebanese, you won't really know a lot of times what they've been through. You meet them in, uh, you meet them in your colleagues in residency and things like that. A lot of them have actually been, lived through war and been through a lot of conflict. Um, so still kind of talking about the prevalence of mental illness, and I'm sorry if I'm talking fast, I really wanna keep with the time constraints. So the effect of post of war exposure PTSD, we saw an odds ratio of 10.24, which is pretty high. The proportions of patients with anxiety disorders seeking treatment was around 37%. And we all know stigma in the Middle East. So these are probably people who have overcome that. And there were a lot of delays to treatment since the age of onset to seeking treatment. So they were long, longer than 28 years for anxiety disorders and depression was around six years. So um, just prevalence of PTSD in the Middle East, there are lots, there's a lot of research about this in the Middle East and there, the prevalence really varies. It's very variable from less than 1% to more than one third of a sample that's been actually surveyed. And there are very, there are higher rates in children. This is actually from the National Center of PTSD. So talking about that, like what a vulnerable population, right? So now I thought that I would give a little bit of a background about disasters. So, and to segue us into what we're gonna talk about in terms of the explosion. So Satra et al, et al did a pretty systematic review of literature on disasters, including natural, nuclear, technologic, major incidents like fires, air crashes, explosions, mass violence too. And it shows that PTSD was most frequently observed in addition it's just it's not just PTSD. We see more mental illness in general, depression, non-specific distress, anxiety. Another study, um, sorry. Another study um, looked at a sample of sur a thousand survivors of the Marmara earthquakes and about six months after the disaster, and they saw like 43% of these people had PTSD still. Um, so then maybe something that pertains a little bit to us, but not really because it was a nuclear disaster, but Shigemura et al. conducted a systematic review investigating the effect of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And what they saw was a very pretty high rate of mental illness. So 8.3 to 65.1% 6 had depressive symptoms, 12 to 52 um, percent, I think was anxiety and 10.5 to 62.5. 6% had PTSD. And having mental illness ahead of time placed people at a high risk to develop symptoms. Um, and this, their original symptoms also got worse after the disaster. 
So it's all kind of stuff that we know, but like just putting that in context of the Lebanese population, they're already at a high risk. So factors that increase risk in terms of PTSD, we all know what the, we don't all know, but the risk factors are childhood trauma, chronic adversity, familial stressors. Factors that impact recovery are the level of social support that you might have, ongoing disruptions, what are the psychological resources that are available to you, and your socioeconomic status, because that can also mean that you have less access to care. Um, so now talking a little bit about the August 4th explosion. Um, so it's the largest non-nuclear blast that ever occurred. There was a det detonation, um, the third largest, sorry, the detonation of 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate caused 200 deaths and around 5,000 injuries and hundreds of missing people at the time. The explosion impacted the Lebanese territory, was heard in Cyprus, and really was perceived in Turkey, Syria, Israel, Palestine, parts of Europe. So a pretty large seismic event of magnitude of 3.3. Um, so the preliminary data of one of our collaborators, Naram Basi, I'm going to present today with her um, consent. She, they surveyed a little bit similar to the study that Dr. Maguf did, but um, mostly in the adult population. We had 1,000 people who responded, and nine, 916 of them um, actually were included in the study. So increased rates of participants taking medication after the blast and increase in mental health issues. Just like Dr. Maguf said, the farther you were from the blast, the less likelihood that you would have PTSD. Factors that increase the risk of having a high PTSD score with a house damage, being injured personally by the explosion or having a friend or family member injured or killed and female gender. This is pretty, this is pretty consistent across all research that female gender does place you at a high risk. So expatriate mental health. So when we got into this because I am um, and a little bit, I'll talk about why we were interested about that, but just giving a background about expatriates. So a study was done by Aetna International that showed 6% of 5,000 expats were worried about mental health. This was in contrast to a quarter of that population worrying about just medical things like hypertension, diabetes, or heart disease. Another study that was done on US expats showed that 50% of the expats were at risk of problems such as anxiety, depression, and around 2.5 times the controlled population. So looking for the trainees here, formulation, which is something we stress on a lot, right? The biopsychosocial approach. So let's look at the expatriate population. What are their risk factors? Biological factors, of course, if their family had already genetic, if they had genetic loading for mental illness, things like that. Social factors. What are the social factors in that population? So lack of social support or access to care. A lot of residents or trainees or people like that are here on their own, for example. Unclear socioeconomic status, I put, because they might actually be struggling socioeconomically, right? And on top of that, their family might be struggling economically, and they might have their extra burden of having to support the family. Ongoing adversity in their own lives, maybe they got a divorce, maybe something's going on there, a culture clash, they have, there are increased um, on a stress because of sometimes culture reasons or like feeling like they don't fit in. The major economic crisis in Lebanon that was even before that, political unrest, several months of protest, the COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot of these people have family back home. They might not be able to leave or might not be able to support them. So those are extra stressors. The psychological factors, maybe they have pre-existing mental illness. Maybe they have their own history of trauma. I mean, we know that a lot of them have already lived the war, but maybe they have more on top of that. Um, so what are considerations for the Lebanese expatriates after the explosion? So one, financial strain, they were already kind of struggling. Um, the Lebanon, I mean, if people, for people who don't know, there's a very, very big economic crisis right now in Lebanon, which is pretty unprecedented. And, um, and so there's a lot of financial strain with the devaluation of the currency. So there's already strain at home. Maybe they're already financially strained here. Loss of home, a, a lot of people lost their homes in Lebanon and um, 
ongoing mental health symptoms they might have some mental health some grief if someone died in the family or or just really grieving the loss of their home um and then the dilemma do i go home do i put my i'm always giving examples about residency and things like that just because it's easier can do i leave my residency and go home to help my family to grieve someone who died how do i come back like it's not something that's going to be solved in a few weeks right it's something ongoing one of our fellows actually lost her home and that was very very difficult period for her um so the dilemma like i said um, so we, that's uh, what we talked about uh, with my collaborators, Gael Rashid, who's here today, Dimitri Fiani, Dr. Margarita Abistad, who's at UMass, and Alfred Shabu. We discussed that constantly, and we decided that we really wanted to have an objective study to test that, to look at the mental health in that very vulnerable population that most people don't usually think is impacted. Um, Okay, so our study design, mostly our study it was a survey that was disseminated through um, social media, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. If I'm forgetting anything, Gail, you can <laughs> you can put it in there. This was the little blurb that was there. And you guys, if you wanted to take the QR code and also kind of spread it around, the study is still open. It opened on March um six and it's still ongoing for six months um and so this is what we did there was a little bit of a few questions about demographic data and then based on those questions so as you guys know what the criteria in the dsm-5 for ptsd to qualify for a PTSD diagnosis, you have to have someone die or be someone close to you or a friend. And I suspect that's what would rule someone in to answer the PTSD questions like the PCL5. Otherwise you would be ruled out and you won't have to fill out the PCL5. And the only thing that you would fill out that's the Hopkins symptom checklist, which is often used in disaster medicine. Um, Okay, so just a few, a little blurb about like our prelim results and what we have. The mean age is 31 in our current, um, we have 1,093 responses by yesterday. So we may have more today, I'm not sure. Uh, females more than males of, and most were born in Lebanon, mean age was 31. Most live in France, USA, Canada, UAE, and most are employed and working full time. But really we've got responses from all over the world, Mozambique, Australia, Ghana, um, really everywhere, Brazil. Majority reported major impact, either physical on someone losing the home, uh, of friends or family. Many reported the blast was caused by negligence from the governing body. We really wanted to test the feelings of people. We really wanted to understand what they're feeling about this. And the majority reported helplessness, even the helplessness when it happened and helpless, continued helplessness. And we know that helplessness faces people at a higher risk for mental illness and for PTSD. A lot of anxiety was reported. And interestingly, many were selected to fill out the PCL5, which means that they were pretty, their fam, friends and family were pretty impacted. Um, this is the last thing that I put. We all know that PTSD after a time, based on the research post-war, is that we have a peak and then we have things that kind of get better. And even with this event, at some point, things are going to get better. And I like that someone <laughs> wrote that uh, next to the port. There's always like a message of hope, like things will get better at some point. And if anything, I can at least say that that's what the research facts. That was my talk, sorry. All right, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Torbay. Uh, so now we're gonna be moving and hearing back uh, from Dr. Bizre. So Dr. Bizre will be discussing the impact of the Beirut port blast on the mental health of the healthcare workers in Lebanon. Uh, she will be sharing some of uh, un unpublished data uh, from a study she led. Uh, and I personally think that this is a very important topic because um, while the mental health of healthcare workers is often overlooked, uh, Dr. Bizri has been uh, very keen on assessing this. She uh, previously explored the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health of healthcare workers in a, a very insightful study that I enjoyed uh, reading. So I, for one, am very excited to learn about the findings of this study. So the floor is yours, Dr. Bizri. So hi everyone, I don't have slides, but um, 
I just I present my data the way it is. First, thank you for um, inviting me and Dr. Manu, and thank you for fundraising for the department. I wanted to add something before uh, I go into the slides. Uh, we also have an OPD. I think Dr. Manu did not mention it, which is an outpatient department from low income backgrounds or low SES. And uh, I think it's very important that people are aware of that in terms of community services that we offer. Um, so I, I wanted to present two separate studies because I think the past two years now, I keep saying the past year, but actually the past two years have been quite dramatic in Lebanon. And uh, I wanted, to, because it's important, we did, so we, we did studies that assess the mental health of healthcare workers that includes doctors and nurses at AUB, but also outside AUB. And that was done in two phases. The first one was actually after the first wave of the pandemic, so in April, 2020. But we also did a second one in December, 2020. And that was, so that was around six months after the blast or, and it was purely blast related. And I'll discuss the differences in findings. So these findings that are related to COVID, the first the lockdown, the pandemic, and then the blast. Uh, so the first study, it's actually interesting because there are different studies, there are different data. So the first one was actually only done at AUB. We didn't have a high response rate, so we had around 200 people, 180. And it was done in April 2020. And we gave them, it was anonymous, obviously, it was online, and they, it was a cross-sectional study that screened for acute distress using the, using the GHQ-28. It, it screened for the risk of developing PTSD using the IES, and the perceived stress, and I think that's important. So 58%, remember that was in April 2020, so the 58% showed a rate of acute distress on the GHQ-28, and only 30% 30 per, 30 had a high risk of developing uh, PTSD. And I, I say, interestingly is that, so nurses had a higher concern for PTSD, but also when looking at the previous mental health history of these uh, participants, not patients, people that had a history of mental illness did not have a higher risk of developing PTSD. And we hypothesized that maybe these patients, and this, is, this was during the first lockdown, and so we hypothesized that maybe these had developed some sort of resilience to stress. And then we conducted in December 2020, a broader multi-center uh, trial for healthcare workers, and that was done across several hospitals in Lebanon, including those that were severely damaged by the blast. Um, and, and we used an online questionnaire that evaluated the risk of developing PTSD. So we used the PCL5 checklist. We had a large number of participants. So we had close to 520 participants. This data is not published yet. And 44% uh, were at high risk for PTSD. So that was uh, not acutely post blast, but done four months later almost. We did not have, as opposed to the natural normal data on PTSD, we did not have significant differences in gender. And that was uh, against the, that was uh, in, the, in the COVID study, we had females who were at high risk of developing PTSD. And uh, healthcare workers who got injured by the blast, lost a relative or friend, or tested positive two weeks after. So remember the blast happened mid COVID, mid pandemic, and uh, the lockdown measures, so we had a higher peak of COVID two weeks post blast. And so a lot of healthcare workers also had tested positive uh, for a COVID in that period. And so these were at high risk of developing PTSD. Three variables almost had double the risk of uh, developing PTSD symptoms, seeking mental health. So that goes with what Dr. Malouf was saying in that these were more um, self-referred patients that had sought mental health and so we were more likely to diagnose them or to capture them. Severe, those who had had severe uh, home damage, as Dr. Torbay was mentioning, or a personal history of PTSD. So here, those that had a personal history of mental health disorder did have a higher rate of uh, a risk of developing PTSD. 
At last, those who tested positive for COVID-19 during the two weeks period that followed the blast had four times the risk of developing PTSD. So I want to mention something, and I think Dr. Malouf touched base on that. So uh, first, 44% of our participants, uh, I said, had a higher risk of PTSD. And we compared it to rescuers post 9-11, as Dr. Malouf had done with the study. And uh, it was almost similar to the rates of PTSD and the, and those who took care of the 9-11 victims, and, which was at 42%. It had higher prevalence than the rate of, which goes with our older data, which was at 30% in the COVID. So it has a higher prevalence of PTSD than healthcare workers that take care of patients during pandemics. So what happens during disasters is a higher rate compared to pandemics in healthcare workers. We also examined, there was a question about the willingness to migrate. Remember, we had close to 520 participants. 391 said they were willing to, migrate, to, uh, to emigrate if they, had, if they had the chance. So 75% of, which I think is a huge number, of healthcare workers. Uh, that, and that was done across multiple hospitals, so across seven medical centers. These were mostly among younger and early career physicians and nurses, so th those that had not uh, had just started their careers. I don't have a long presentation, but I think this is interesting when I say there's 75% that are willing to migrate. And that was not an acute emotional reaction because that was four months, five months after the blast. And so uh, I, I think I'll move on from here to a problem that we've been facing. So as uh, Dr. Shaito had mentioned, I, uh, I, we, we have the psycho-oncology program at AUB. And uh, I, I just, I, one of the problems we have been facing is, the, is that specialized nurses have been leaving. So we've had shortages, we've had to readjust, and it's really, uh, it's a bummer actually, because, uh, so as a reminder, the most conservative numbers are that 20% of patients with cancer need specialized psychosocial services. You guys know this probably. And uh, the Nate Brasil Institute, which is the cancer institute that we have, has a load of close to 4,000, 65 to 80 patients that are presenting to take chemotherapy. And they have a huge fund to get them. They fund their transport, they fund everything. And so it's a, it's a shame really, because we have this uh, very, uh, expansive service for cancer patients, but we just don't have the specialized services anymore to be able to attend to their uh, psychological needs. Um, so when we created the psycho-oncology service, and it's an actually interesting service because we make sure to capture every patient that presents the moment they enter the system, every patient with cancer. Uh, so we meet the patients where they are, they don't come to our offices, we meet them while they're doing their chemotherapy, we have a health psychologist, I'm the psychiatrist, and we had specialized psychiatric nurses that did psychiatric screening uh, on each patient. Uh, and it developed quite quickly, this uh, launched, uh, with the support of Dr. Malouf, this launched during the pandemic in April 2020, and despite that, it really developed quite rapidly uh, because of the unmet needs, but we found challenges that are really surprisingly less related to the fear of stigma in mental health or cancer, and more so, to, more, they have more to do, unfortunately, with logistics. So the first challenges were, of course, getting oncologists on board, but that was quickly resolved. And then there was a lack of funding and limited telemedicine applicability, applicability in these patients. And then, obviously, the shortage of human resources. So we have most of our psychiatric nurses have left. And uh, we have only one left that can do the screening. Uh, I don't know if I should talk a bit about our consult service. Dr. Malouf touched on that. Our, de our department uh, ha has had to reorganize a bit due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We created uh, rapidly, actually, a COVID-19 in the early days of the pandemic, meaning every patient that presented to the specialized uh, flu clinic or the pandemic center, and with the help with, uh, from our uh, primary care colleagues, they were screened for psychological distress straight, straight upon presentation. And those who screened positive had available free of charge mental health services, whether they were admitted or quarantined at home. So whether even when they left home, 
we had trainees, whether psychology trainees or our residents who were on a daily basis checking in with these patients if they had agreed to do so. So, uh, and it was really a, a strong interdepartmental and intradepartmental effort. And then when the first wave resolved, the second wave that we had in Lebanon was a bigger one. Remember the second wave came with the context of the blast, the economic stress. And uh, so the hospital was already stretched with a big load. And so we had to switch gear to a more responsive consult model. So what we did over setting our limits and helping our frontline colleagues. And so to be efficient and rapid, we put forth protocols that were circulated among department heads for the most common uh, psychiatric conditions in COVID. So every department had a quick uh, sheet, quick Yeah. Also, as Dr. Malouf mentioned, we also used our virtual consultation. So we, my connection is not very stable. Uh, we did uh, we did some of the patients with services if uh, if they were cool, especially in the ED. But uh, mostly we and I think uh, Dr. Malouf did not mention this. We rapidly. Uh, the first service that, took, that started the television service in, at AU uh, consultations to minimize unnecessary exposure. Uh, that was it. Again, thank you for having me. And uh, thank uh, Yanni. Uh, I know this is an opportunity to raise funds for the uh, AUB psychiatry department and I just want to say that we really do have a big community outreach program uh, that involves both psychotherapy and psychiatry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. And we also offer, I just want to say something, we also offer, uh, because my study was on healthcare workers that were suffering, healthcare workers who work at AUB have the option because mental health is not covered by insurance in Lebanon. So they also have the option to, we have the counseling center for students, but we also, the, the HIP, which is the insurance of health services, including uh, group therapy, psychiatry, psychology. So that's also an area where funding would be really needed. Thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant, Dr. Bisri. Thank you so much for you and to all our wonderful panelists for their extreme generosity intelligence and wonderful presence. Um, and now we're going to move to the Q&As. Our first couple of questions are for Dr. Abi Rashid. Um, one is from uh, Dr. Hankir Ahmed, and uh, he's asking, what barriers do we face when we are trying to bring Dixon's friendship bench to Beirut? I'm not sure this should be addressed to me, but probably to the other panelists. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll defer <laughs> to the practitioners. What do they think? Sorry, I didn't get the question. So again, either. what barriers do we face when trying to bring Dixon's friendship bench to Beirut? And I will admit, I don't necessarily understand what we're alluding to here, but this is the question. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm utterly blown away, no pun intended. I didn't mean to be insensitive. Humbled, inspired by the erudition um, and the passion of all the speakers. I'm honestly, uh, uh, I'm almost tongue-tied. I can elaborate. So presumably we're familiar with Dixon Chipanda and his friendship bench in Harare in Zimbabwe. You know, that pervasive treatment gap. And he trained grandmothers to deliver. We don't know Dixon. I admit, I do not know any. Seriously? Yes, please explain to Oh us. my goodness. Right. I'm so sorry. Uh, forgive me. I thought we were familiar with it. So you know, uh, there are like 14 psychiatrists for a population of 16 million in Zimbabwe. So what Dixon Chipanda did was he trained grandmothers to deliver low intensity psychological therapy to people experiencing common mental disorders. And they published their findings in JAMA. It was a randomized controlled trial and grandmothers were better than doctors at treating depression. Yeah, this is, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Hankir. This is uh, sim maybe a little similar to what uh, Vikram Patel did in India with the task shifting. And this uh, was 
also adopted by uh, WHO through their, uh, their program. Uh, the uh, Ministry of Health did uh, have a um, strategy uh, that I think, you know, most of it has been implemented and uh, a part of the strategy was to train uh, non-mental health uh, specialists to deliver specific mental health interventions, including IPT, which is interpersonal uh, psychotherapy. But these were primarily either primary care physicians or nurses. Uh, so they did have to have, they did have uh, some health uh, background um, and uh, these uh, are being delivered, these uh, interventions are being delivered in some community-based uh, mental health centers uh, through the Ministry of Health in Lebanon. What about TETAS? I'm not uh, aware that TETAS, TETAS stands for uh, grandmas in Lebanon. So I'm not aware that TETAS are being used in Lebanon to deliver uh, mental health in interventions, but definitely TETAS love can go a long way uh, to give uh, So we have an opportunity here, if, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Ma'alouf. Uh, yeah, yeah. Probably okay. they're doing it in any case. Without them, yeah. probably the situation would have been worse. <laughs> So there let's is... get some funding because I think uh, Professor Chipanda, because he collaborated with Melanie Abbas, Prof Abbas at the IOPPN here at Maudsley, and they got one million from Grand Challenges in Canada. So if it's happening already, then we might as well get some funding for it. It's just my humble opinion, which I'm vocalizing. Thank you. Okay. I can see that your humble opinion is also quite humorous and touching. I, I saw smiles cracking all over the Zoom screen. So we all well, love I was business. I was hoping that my humor might be communicable. So that's good. Uh, we're going to have another question for Dr. Abir Rashid from uh, Sheikh Shaib. He says, great informative presentation, Dr. Abir Rashid. I want to ask, what were the specific mental health challenges you faced in the face of conflict? Yes, good question. I mean, I, I wasn't sure what conflict, because we have many conflicts in Lebanon he was referring to, but but I can say that in, in the book I wrote that, that you mentioned, Sarah, so as for the, I look at the impact of civil war and conflict and immigration, actually. So on the emergence of psychiatric disorders that the panelists have, have touched on. And, and by the way, so Mrs. Torbay, uh, uh, or Dr. Torbay, sorry, uh, spoke of mental health, of the mental health of expats. Well, interestingly, as early as the 20, in the 20th century, uh, insanity, as it was called, caused by immigration was a major diagnostic preoccupation back then, uh, a major psychiatric diagnosis at as And I also look at, so the impact of war on healthcare infrastructure. And by that, I mean, not only the physical infrastructure, but the symbolic infrastructure. And what we see happening in the civil war, at least in Lebanon in the mid 1970s, is a new kind of violence that manifests itself in hospitals, in outpatient clinics. So in, in, in usually what, what so far has been sacred and neutral places. And I asked the questions, so what is the impact of modern warf warfare, uh, not only on the emergence of PTSD and, uh, and the traumatic discourse more broadly speaking, but also on this mutation that happens, this, this metamorphosis, we move from a, a notion of a hospital as a, as a sacred, as a neutral space, to a site of violence, of death and misery, uh, instead of hope and cure. So th this would be uh, my answer about uh, the impact of conflict. Thank you, Dr. Abir Rashid. That was a beautifully put answer. I see that we have five minutes left, so I will be swift. Uh, again, with Dr. Hankir, who was asking how um, the Psychiatry Institute and Psychology and Neuroscience Institute at King's College could help. And I see there was an interesting um, exchange in the chat, but I'm putting it out there just to reiterate. And one question from Dr. Uh, Dr. Gaffaz, who asks us all, great speakers and questions to my Lebanese colleagues. Uh, I'm, Rwanda, uh, I'm Rwanda from Libya. Does your government support the departments of psychiatry just as equally as all other medical specialties? And that will be our last question for today. Does the government support psychiatry? That is the yes. question. As much as other medical specialties. Um, so we don't have, uh, Dr. Manuf, do you want to answer that? We don't have really. Go ahead, go ahead, Maya. 
uh, I think we don't have a lot of, so we don't have a lot of psychiatric beds, but they don't cover mostly, uh, even if we did, they don't cover uh, hospital admissions. Uh, we don't, not as a government and not as Mahek Dr. Maloub and not as private insurances either. I think that's the uh, big setback that we have in terms of providing mental health services in London. Yeah, this is a big problem. So here, psychiatric services are not in private hospitals. I mean, there are there is uh, there are a couple of governmental hospitals, but these do not have psychiatric facilities, uh, psychiatric units. So uh, psychiatric care is typically provided within general hospitals, and within general hospitals, this care is not covered by the government, and it's neither covered by uh, private insurance carriers, which is a major problem. So people end up paying out of pocket. Uh, that's why, you know, fundraising efforts like this one and uh, others uh, are very important to support uh, the care of those who can't afford it. Uh, because even if you have the premium private insurance that would cover your open heart surgery, which would cost $100,000, uh, the same insurance would not cover your two-day stay at a psychiatric unit. I would also add that sometimes patients that come in, uh, let's say with a severe suicide attempt, end up in the ICU, and then they have to be transferred to psychiatry two weeks after that. So the, most of their stay was actually on the medical ward because of medical conditions, because of medical needs. Their whole stay would not be covered just because the cause of admission was a psychiatric cause. So you can say, so you can see how much um, that would be costly on patients. It breaks my heart, really. Um, but I don't want to end on a on that note. This is about witnessing and co-creating hope. So let's uh, march forward, and I will deliver this event back to the hands of Sonia and Victor to close. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers um, for joining. Uh, from Paris, from Baltimore, from Beirut, uh, in this in this Sunday at different times. Thank you very much to to Sarah and to to Mohammed for for organizing this, um, and moderating this. Actually, uh, this was the I think the the idea to organize this is very. Um, I think it it came first, maybe a month ago or a month and a half ago. And, and, and we were talking, Sarah and I, and, and she immediately clicked in and, and start working and organize this in a, in a record time. Um, I want to thank all the people who joined us live. So between Zoom and uh, on Facebook, we have uh, around 30 uh, live participants and we will have an, an also greeting from the past to all those who will be or who are now watching in the future uh, this recording uh, on YouTube, and um, and um, and it's 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 a pleasure for us at the at the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees to really um, to really expand um, uh, genuine uh, global mental health perspectives that and 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 we want to 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 share these stories and to to listen to the people who are working. In, the, in, in, in those areas, because global mental health is just not a beautiful set of words to get funds or, or to, to, to show people that you are doing a great job. Uh, global mental health is actually listening to the stories and, and supporting uh, the, the people who are there. And, and I will give um, Sania the opportunity to close the, the event with a couple of words. Thank you, Victor. And thank you, everybody, all of you who have taken the time to be here today. You could have been doing anything with your time Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, but you chose to be here. So thank you. I appreciate it, as I'm sure Victor and Sarah and Muhammad do too. Great job, you guys, being the moderators of the forum. Um, I'm glad it went by smoothly and we kept to the time and everything. Um, I'm, I'm just so happy that this has gone well. It's the fourth forum at its close. This has been a place truly where creativity has been on display. Opinions have been shared and perspectives have been exchanged. So thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah. Uh, Bye.